Bruce Richards is the CEO and chairman and co-founder of Marathon Asset Management. I used to talk to him all the time uh, when Alex Seal and I used to uh, present in the afternoons. We talked more about what was happening in the United States. He's got, a, he's got an office over here as well. So it's great to have you on set. Nice, nice to see, to see you, guys. Bruce. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you joining for us. Yeah. Look, there's so much to talk about. Well, I want to talk about those comments from Camper. I want to talk about what Jay Powell spoke about yesterday and his confidence about what's going on with, with the rate story in the United States. Let's kind of set the stage with the, with the Fed story, first of all, and the, mm. kind of the broader central banking Perfect. story. The, the market's getting towards pricing three Fed cuts this year. Yeah, I, I'm been in a two camp, and so I think you know, two is the number that I'm going to set with, but September seems to be a lock, and it's not only the Fed, but we have over here the ECB and B of A, B of, uh, Bank of England, yep. that is both, all three actually, trifecta, probably going to raise uh, lower rates by 25 base points. So, so what happens to markets when rates start coming down in a meaningful way? When the Fed starts cutting rates, is it, is it all clear in the commercial real estate market? Is it all clear in the regional banking market? Like, wh what is the effect of that? So I think it will be positive for regional banks because I think when rates do start to come down, a po more positive yield curve will be constructive as their borrowing costs come down. So yep. there's no doubt in my mind that regional banks will benefit from lower rates. And as it relates to commercial real estate, that's a slightly different story. And the reason why it's a slightly different story is because the debt stack is just so large in calendar year 2024 and 2025 yep. that there's going to be problems because all these loans that have been extended and amended and extended into this calendar year, being pushed out in the next year, has to work their way through the system. So there's going to be an amazing amount of opportunity, I think, front rates, for... Front, for, for, front for, end rates come down. Isn't that a good thing? Well, their financing costs come down a little bit, but you're talking about 25 basis points, another 25 basis points. It's still not much. There's going to be a couple pauses along the way, so it's going to take time. So number one. Number two is the term structure of interest rates are really important. So as so what's really important is what happens with 10-year rates because the 10-year is how you price cap rates. Yep. And cap rates are simply going to determine valuation for a lot of these properties in addition to you know, the cash flows you can generate. And so I think that real estate has a number of problems in the, measured in the trillions globally. And here in Europe, the number is probably a trillion. In the U.S., probably a bit more than a trillion in terms of real estate property that's going to yep. be transferred to new owners and the creditors before you work it all out. And that's going to take some time. That's a two to three year workout. So it's not just a quick fix. But I think as it relates to the banks, I think the banks are generally in good shape. They've been through the worst. Yep. And with the borrowing costs coming down, that's net net positive. A two to three year uh, for, for that to all kind of trickle across. The, and that's just in that one part part of the market. Walk us through what the kind of long and variable lag that Powell keeps uh, referring to from, from Eco 101 sound like right now. Are we on the shorter end of that um, transmission mechanism? Well, I think, you know, speaking about the transmission mechanism, at the was August 22nd Jackson Hole meeting, his whole speech, his keynote speech, is going to be about reassessing monetary policy and the transmission mechanism itself. Yeah. And so that's going to be the keynote speech. And what he's going to, if he's going to be fully transparent with us, what he's going to say is, although the Fed still has its powers and the transmission mechanism works, it didn't work this time. And the reason why it didn't work this time as effectively is because simply the Fed waited way too long to start raising rates, number one. Number two, they continue to do quantitative easing for six full months after they started raising rates, which makes no sense because you wouldn't want to do quantitative easing while you're tightening. Yeah. That's offsetting factor. And, and most importantly, fiscal spending was a bit out of control in the states, and all that stimulus on the fiscal side, which led to deficits, also you know, negated a lot of the good work that the Fed was doing when they were raising rates. Yeah. And so there are many other factors that also contribute, but those are the key gating factors that I think this time around negated some of that transmission mechanism. In addition to that, you know, what we've also noticed is in the U.S., very different from here in the U.K., in the U.S., the home mortgage market is a fixed rate mortgage market. Yeah. And a lot of those folks had rates locked in at 3 to 4 percent, and so with rates locked in that low, you know, homeowners didn't feel any of the stress at all from uh, rising rates. So you talk about that fiscal spend, though, and, and I want to come back to that. Of course, it's been um, a, a tumultuous couple of weeks, months, I'd argue, in, in, in U.S. politics. When we talk about 
what that shows up in in terms of <clears throat> more kind of uh, uh, stimulatory uh, uh, policies, things like forgiving student debt, for example, from the Biden administration, or, or there's now talk about a potential rent cap of, of 5% from the Biden administration versus something like a, uh, spending more in, in oil or, or tariffs or kind of more protectionist policies on Trump. How does the Fed respond to something like that? Is it too early for them to start thinking about it? Yeah, I think it is too early. I think clearly inflation is on a trend path back down to 2%, so that's great. Unless the fiscal policy changes. So, so, so and I think it's clearly on that trend path. And I think it takes a while for trends to change. Um, and so we'll have to see what the impact is. But, you know, along the politics and, and, and the Trump trade versus the current administration, President Biden's trade, there's a very vastly different set of circumstances. A, with respect to tax rate, B, with respect to trade and tariffs, and, and also with respect to regulations. Um, but it'll be a free market, um, less regulatory environment uh, under, the, um, uh, under the Trump administration um, if he were to be reelected versus the current administration where Biden um, you know, um, is, I think, very heavy-handed uh, with respect to regulations. So it's, Trump is better for the economy, then? Is that what you're saying? I wouldn't say better for the economy. I'd say uh, the markets are probably going to respond more favorably. Um, okay. but, it's, but it's very, very you know, um, uh, specific. So you take a look at like less regulation for oil and gas, and that means a lot of probably pumping of oil and gas. It probably means a lower commodity price. So what is the investment that you make there? Yep. Probably in oil services. Probably all services. You're investing benefit. in all services, Bruce. Uh, well, we're, we're you know it's not necessarily <laughs> no, not yeah. right now. But I'm saying that's probably a sector market that would yep. benefit where commodity prices itself might not benefit, despite yeah. you know what is a favorable environment for oil and gas. So it's all very very nuanced. Bruce, you talked and look, I'm paraphrasing, but in your answer to, to one of Guy's questions, so correct me if I'm paraphrasing it incorrectly. But I, I took from this, Guy said, "Is it is it all clear once rates start moving down for parts of this credit market?" You essentially said, "No, it's not necessarily all clear. There's still pressure. There's still tension across some of these portfolios, but there are opportunities." You said there are opportunities. Where are those opportunities? Where are you going to be zeroing in on once those rates move lower? So rates will move lower, but let's just couch it the right way. Yeah. So I think the Fed does, and ECB and B of A, do move rates lower, but I think it's a step function. When the Fed started raising rates, they raised rates 525 base points over 11 meetings with 11 successive meetings. When they start lowering rates, they'll lower rates once or twice and then pause. What are the policies that are coming out of government? Because they've learned the transmission mechanism can be greatly impacted by these policies, and they're going to measure that much more in a much more refined way this time around. And second, what are the stimulus impacts from lowering rates or the monetary stimulus that comes from that? Yeah. And so I think it'll be a very slow path down. And I think the R star will be permanently higher than where it had been in the last decade. And so what that means is a positive yield curve. Yeah. And it also means, I think, higher for longer despite rates coming down. Okay. And so I think the same investment opportunities that you've seen in the last few years will prevail in the next few years. Private credit, credit markets are going to be a magnificent investment despite a lower term structure. But you might want to lean in towards some of the longer duration fixed rate paper if you think rates are coming down mm -hmm. at the intermediate or longer end uh, with, a, with a Fed you know, loosening of monetary policy. Are you worried that your image, your, your, your business, your not your business particularly, but your sector is getting a bit of an image problem. I mean, quote with Jamie, Jamie Dimon, for example, saying some of these things, private credit, uh, not marked to market with the same discipline that we do. We've heard from regulators that the concerns we had that sound. But how, how, would you, how do you address those concerns? Is this, Jay, is this Jamie Dimon envious at the role that private credit is playing? I think this is Jamie Dimon, the brilliant banker and brilliant CEO that he is, wanting a little bit of the market share back, um, you know, in the banking book where private credit has really stepped up. And, and I think private credit stepping up is, is such a positive thing because the circuit breaker, when banks stop lending like they had in the past, when indeed, you know, tighter monetary policy causes banks to pull back, private credit really stepped up in a big way and extended credit, keeping the economy moving, keeping companies' um, uh, ability to access debt uh, very fluid, and, and that's a very positive thing. Competition is good. And while 
Jamie and the bankers didn't have much competition in generations past. In the current generation, it's a very competitive market. The private credit markets are measured in trillions now. That's trillions less that the banks have on their balance sheet extending yep. loans and trillions more that private credit investors now can exploit and can uh, capitalize for their clients. So that's fair and that they private credit has filled the gap, but it's also created a little bit of liquidity crunch because there there isn't it, it's kind of wrapped up in private equity. You're seeing that with some of the hedge funds or some of the lack of buyout exits, uh, for example. But I'm curious, one of the comparisons that Jamie Dimon made to, to bring it back to his banking perspective is to back it to the housing crisis pre pre GFC. And the comparison he's making is that the deal structures itself are are too complicated. And you see that in some of the private credit deals. The super return people were we're talking about it, uh, synthetic financing, et cetera, and, and having more complicated covenants. Is that not a concern to you that sometimes this product may be getting too complicated in an industry that's growing too fast and seeing too much optimism? I think capital structures are for companies to choose. I think providing these companies with the flexibility to choose their capital structures is what markets are all about. Private credit can allow for that to occur, allow for company to have flexible capital. Is it complicated? Yes, which is why you leave it up to the pros. Okay, the you leave it up to the pros. I get that. Campus talking, uh, the, the, the soundbite we played on the way in was, <clears throat> yeah, that's fine, but we just want to know a little bit more. We want some transparency. Pr the, the private bit is the bit that seems to be causing concerns right now. Are you, do you think Europe is going to forge ahead maybe slightly quicker than the United States in in, mm -hmm. in requiring that transparency, understanding the, the linkages. Yeah. So, so let's, tra let's distinguish transparency yeah. versus regulation. Sure. So banks are regulated because they take deposits, and they're re regulated by the Fed, OCC in the U.S., by the ECB here, um, and, and so they're regulated institutions as they should be. And so the strength of their balance sheets are really, really important. Now, private credit, we are unregulated from a banking standpoint because we're not banks. We're not taking deposits. We're not guaranteeing, you know, um, depositors yep. a return. And, and so from our perspective, as long as we have the proper disclosure in our documents that our investors know exactly what we're doing, which they do, and we're fully transparent with investors, which we are, yep. then I think, you know, working in a, a, in a regulatory environment where the SEC or your regulatory authority properly regulates you is the proper regulation that already, ex or already exists. Yep. Now, would we be welcome to another authority that tells us what type of loans we can make and not make? Yep. Of course, we'll do whatever the regulators require. Does that make sense in this case? Probably not because we're unregulated banks, we're the private credit markets, and we do provide full transparency to our investors. Should we, should we make even greater transparency? I'm all in favor of that.